It is 7 p.m. I am calling this Germantown School District Board of Education meeting to order. Please rise if you're able and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance and a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance Official meeting notification, Dr. Reuter. Public notice of all meetings has been given by communication from the superintendent's office to the public, to those news media who have requested such notices, and to the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, Northwest Now, Express News, and the West Bend Daily News. Public notice has also been posted in our schools throughout the district and on the Germantown School District website. Thank you. Item B, roll call. Medved. Here. Ewert. Here. Barney's here. Both. Here. Pollock. Here. Higginbotham. Here. Brown. Here. Item two, approval of the agenda. Do I have a motion? Motion to approve the agenda. Second. Barney and Ewert with a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That passes. Moving on to item three, reports. Item A. <clears throat> yes, Mr. Administrator, update, Dr. Ritter. Thank you. Um, we're coming to a close here. I believe we have less than, I think, 13 days total left um, in, in our school year. Uh, as you know, as a board, you're all formally invited to our June 4th graduation ceremony here at Germantown High School at 1 p.m. That will be in the field house, as well as the KMS promotion ceremony will take place on June 9th at 9, 8.30. Um, Ms. Velboom's house will be the first to go through a promotion ceremony and then at 9.30, Ms. Hill Schaefer's uh, house as well. So all of you are invited to that and if you can RSVP with Melissa, that would be excellent. Also, we have many end of the school year events. Um, it's very busy. We have coming up at, at the elementary level, we have um, visits to Camp Whitcomb and our graduation walk, which is always great. Our high school seniors go back to their elementary and walk through for a formal uh, goodbye to Germantown School District and see their other their former teachers. Um, and the last thing to report on something that we have uh, initiated this year with the work of our principals and our teaching staff is K2 map testing. Um, previously we've only done that grades three through five. We have administered map, re map testing in reading and math for all of our K2 students. The results of those will go home this um, at the conclusion of the school year like they do in grades three through five. And it, Again, the reason for that is to, to, to monitor growth of our students in reading and math and utilize those data points for future use around uh, multi-tiered systems of support in our I, RTI process. So um, Mr. Miziak will most likely give updates this summer on um, that process and what that looked like through the Teaching and Learning Committee. So just a few updates um, this evening on the closing of our school year. Very good, thank you. Any comments, questions? Okay, we're down to item B, student representative report. Come on down. Welcome. Hello, good evening. This works, all right. Um, at Amy Bell, the excitement is building as summer is approaching and the weather turns nice. However, they have not stopped working hard. They have all been working hard on their reading thanks to the second grade teachers. They have established a little lending library, which is currently located in the cafeteria. However, plans are on their way to have a family construct an outdoor stand for the students to enjoy during the summer. To keep the Wildcats active and engaged, the PTA program has been organizing vigorous activities. Currently, the students are participating in a program where they are aiming to collectively walk the distance from Florida to Wisconsin during resource, or recess. During the destination, the imagination team just left this past week to compete at global finals. They are showcasing their talent and hard work. Um, in honor of Bus Driver Appreciation Day, the PTA is arranging a special breakfast for all the bus drivers. Additionally, the bus drivers will receive a unique book created by all the students. The excitement continues to mount as the school prepares for their nature day on June 1st. All the students, including those in 4K, will be spending their day at Camp Minicani. They will have a fun, wide range of activities. Over at County Line, the County Line Comets have been busy these past few weeks. The PTA hosted a marvelous muffins at the beginning of May. 
Over 400 parents and students attended this event, which was held in the Crossway Church parking lot. They also had an all-school superhero day to celebrate the last month PBIS focus of cooperation. This month, they are working on courage. The students completed their spring portion of the marathon as well. Students ran laps at recess, which totaled either a half marathon or a full marathon. And as they wrap up their school year, they will be having a school bag lunch picnic day in June. Over at MacArthur, the PTA recently organized a highly anticipated fun run that was enjoyed by all the mini scholars. This event was uh, filled with various activities, creating lasting memories under the warm sun. The atmosphere was lively and exciting, making it a, joy, a joyful day to remember. The third graders at MacArthur recently showcased their hard work and talents through a wonderful concert. They impressed everyone with their performance, demonstrating their progress they've made throughout the year. It was a proud moment for both the students and their teachers. This month, they focused, um, the Eagles focused on creativity. They are encouraged to tap into their imagination and think outside the box to create something new and find innovative solutions to problems. It is a valuable skill that will serve them well in the future. Looking ahead at the upcoming weeks, MacArthur is filled with some exciting events. The students are eagerly awaiting the ever most popular field day, where they can engage in friendly competition and enjoy a day in the fun sun. It is an event that brings the entire school and community together. As the school year draws to the end, they are motivated to make the most of their remaining time and cherish the moments they have started. Um, the school year at Rockfield has seeming flown by, leaving the staff amazed at the progress they have witnessed in the students in their writing abilities. Throughout the month of May, their focus remains on nurturing the students' creativity and encourage them to explore new options and problem solve. On May 8th, Rockfield Elementary students celebrated a special event called Mix It Up at lunch. The students wore mismatched clothes and had the opportunity to sit with someone new during their lunchtime. This event aimed to foster a great understanding of others and create new friendships among other students. Although the school year is winding down, there are still a few exciting events planned at Rockfield. All the students from kindergarten to fifth grade have the opportunity to spend the entire day at Camp Minakani. This, promise, uh, this has promised a day to be with outdoor activities and valuable learning skills for all. Additionally, an inflatable day has been organized for the students. Several inflatable structures will be set up for the kids in, kinder, in grades K to five to enjoy the day in pl play. To add to the excitement, the Kona ice truck will be reserved to provide the students with a delightful sweet treat. This event uh, serves as a great way to get, send the students off as they bounce out of the rock field. Um, the students and staff at Kennedy Middle School are filled with excitement as they approach the end of the school year. The students are uh, particularly delighted as they have just finished up their MAP state testing, um, marking a significant milestone in their academic journey. With clubs and activities winding down, everyone is preparing to close out the school year on a high note. In music, Kennedy Middle Schoolers uh, had a remar remarkable showing at the solo and ensemble event. Several students received an outstanding score of ones and twos, showcasing their talent and dedication. As a result, these students were awarded scholarships to attend a summer music camp and a testament to their hard work and commitment to the music program. Meanwhile, the art students are buzzing away with a lot of different projects. These projects students not only develop their artistic abilities, but also learn measurement, enlargement techniques, matting, and presentation, empowering them to proudly showcase their talents and achievements through the school. The creativity and learning is ever flowing at KMS. At Germantown High School, the atmosphere is buzzing with preparation for final exams and the anticipation of graduation for seniors. However, the pace of activities and achievements has not slowed down one bit. The musicians at GHS have also been busy participating in the solo ensemble con um, competition. The Germantown High School had an impressive 42 entries, with 31 of them earning a superior rating, showcasing their talent and dedication of the music program. The Wall of Sound, the school's marching band, has already begun preparation for the upcoming fall marching season. Their dedication and hard work during the practices and rehearsals will surely contribute to the remarkable performances. The Germantown Forensics team earned a WISDAA District uh, Distinguished in Speech Award, a testament to their excellent performance at the State Speech Festival. The Germantown baseball and softball team have been putting in countless hours of hard work to ensure a successful dis season despite the challenge posed by inclement weather. The, the determination and dedication have propelled them forward. 
Similarly, the boys' golf team has uh, been impressing everyone with their exceptional performance throughout the season, and overcoming the obstacles posed by rainy conditions. The girls' soccer team has been enjoying a series of victories in recent games, showcasing their skills, talent, and hard work. The JV track team just concluded their season on a high note, achieving remarkable outcomes at conference. On the other hand, the varsity team has just competed at conference and is now gearing up for regionals tonight and sectionals this coming Friday, representing GHS with their talent and hard work. With final exams on the horizon, the students and staff at GHS are getting ready to wrap up their school year and are eagerly looking forward to a well-deserved summer break. The accomplishments and dedications of the students in various activities and sports reflects the vibrant spirit and commitment to the excellent at Germantown High School. Thank you. Thank you. Another outstanding report. Very thorough. Appreciate it. Um, it's always great to hear the many, many activities that are going on throughout the school district. Thank you for that. Anyone? Anyone else? Great job. Thanks for the update. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on to item C, ITEEA 2022 Program Excellence Awards. Miss Jess Jaren. Hello. Welcome. Yes, my name is Jessica Guerin. I'm the principal of Kennedy, and I'm here to introduce who, two people you probably already know, but Mr. Jeff Filke here and Mr. John Parrish. They have recently been honored with one of the greatest and highest honors given to technology and engineering education programs. The ITEEA is International Technology Engineering Educators Association, and they were given the program Excellent Award, which they were able to receive and were presented with in April. So they're here just to tell you a little bit about that, but I'll tell you a little bit about them. Jeff is, has been teaching tech ed and vocation ed, vocational ed for 39 years. They probably just want you to stand up so they can see you. <laughs> <laughs> for two seconds. <laughs> 39 years of teaching in tech ed and vocational ed, 17 years in the high school level, 22 at middle school, 12 years we've been blessed with him at KMS. And he became a teacher for Tech Ed because he loves working with his hands and he inspires, likes to inspire kids to do the same. So Mr. Jeff Flukey. Then we got Mr. John Parrish as well. Our Tech Ed department is fully represented here. Um, he has been teaching in classrooms for over 30 years. He was originally educated as a social studies teacher and he was beginning to lose hope after 50 or 60 job applications and only two interviews. Sorry, I didn't mean to laugh, Jeff, John. Um, where he didn't get the job, <laughs> he didn't get the job, um, but he's entering his fourth year at substitute teaching when a series of life events led him to a UW Stout career office where they encouraged him to become a technical education teacher. And we're glad they did, because he entered their master programs in 1997, graduated in 99, and has been at KMS ever since. So this is John Parrish. They're going to tell you a little bit about this award that they got, but we're just really proud of having them at Kennedy. Um, we already know that they're awesome and award-winning, but now they've got a plaque to prove it. So here's Jeff and John. Uh, good evening. Uh, first of all, we'd like to thank you for administration and school board for supporting the program. Because uh, without the support, we wouldn't have the flexibility to develop you know, high-level curriculum and try different things. Uh, we also have a huge business and industry support in the area that helps us financially with equipment, materials, and again, without their help, we wouldn't have all the cool equipment for the kids to use and materials so we don't have to use our budget to buy things. Um, in 13 and last year, we achieved Program of the Year Award at the State of Wisconsin and they only give that to one middle school in the state. And so we were able to get that twice now. And then in 14 and this 2023, we achieved the Program of Excellence Award. What that is is you, they take a portfolio, take a look at what you do with the kids, your curriculum, everything involved, and compare it to an international standard uh, with technology and engineering. And then if you meet the standard, then you achieve the award. Only eight middle schools this year were granted that award across the United States, and we were fortunate you know, to be one of them. So, John, anything else you want to add? Yeah, I just want to echo the support. Thank you. You've always been pretty good, uh, pretty good to us. I did want to say, you know, with budget cuts and whatnot, I got a mic, we're here, but we pride ourselves on the robotics program, and that is not an inexpensive program. And some of the parts, particularly the onboard computer, run about $250 a piece. 
And these are in a middle school. And some of them have done amazingly well and lasted a dozen years. But some of them are just aging out because of the technology and, and new things are being introduced. So please just be aware when you're thinking, you know, how the money is spent in this district. And, you know, everybody needs some, but a really good ro robotics program, you know, takes a little more. Also, while I'm here, I actually just want to congratulate Jess Guerin on finishing a first great year at Kennedy. She's just been doing a wonderful job there. Yeah. And, uh, supportive of us and supportive of everyone else. She brings a lot of energy and a lot of good ideas. So I'm looking forward to a lot more. Thank you. Are any questions for us? <laughs> well, first of all, I would like say thank you. We've been hearing the good things about you guys for a long time, and you know, some of us have students that went through your programs as well, so we got to experience the, the things that you do for our students firsthand, and very much appreciate all that you guys do. It's definitely well deserved. Um, we know what kind of a program that you guys put together. We've toured your facilities and we see what you do on a daily basis and you guys are great and Germantown is lucky to have you as well. So thanks for all your hard work and all you do for us and our students. It's much appreciated. You guys are always welcome to pop in if you like. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it's a great tour. Definitely right. want to see it. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on to item B, <laughs> committee assignments 23-24. Um, this one's me. Um, in your packets, you'll see that we have all of the new committee assignments for board laid out. And for the people at home or in the audience, it is also available online. So you'll be able to see who's on what committee. Every year, we reorganize our committees. And we have two new members this year. So that required a little bit of juggling. But I think everybody got the positions and on the committees that they wanted to be on. So moving forward, those are all set. Any questions? Okay, moving on to item four, citizen comments. We have several people tonight. Um, I'll read the first name and I'll give the person that's gonna be on deck as well. First up is Sandy Tai, and then on deck will be Linda Paw. Hi, my name is Sandy Pai, Sandy P. actually. Um, I guess I'm here and I'm going to speak from the heart. Um, I have a major concern. I walk my dogs in Altbauer Park and there were swastikas there. And I guess the next day, the same kids that drew the swastikas pulled a knife, fifth graders pulled a knife on some kids for their crumble cookie. And as a member of the community that really enjoys going to the parks, and especially being a little more senior, this is of grave concern to me because I've heard from other students in our neighborhood there has been an issue with swastikas in the schools. Um, and also some colorful language. And I'm really getting nervous walking my dogs in the park. And we only have a few weeks left to the school year. And I'm really hoping this gets addressed because it could be a very long summer if these kids are continued to be allowed to get away with this until it can be ne addressed next school year in the fall. Um, if you want to shove stuff under the rug within the school, Number one, I disagree with that. I think it needs to be addressed immediately and severely. But when it reaches out into the community, it's, it's, it's severe. And the fact that it's occurring in the park where I enjoy walking my dogs for some peace of mind and to enjoy my afternoon and to rest up, it really rattles me. And th that's a hateful sign. It's, it's pure hate. And this should not be happening. This does not bode well for our community at all. And I really seriously hope that you all address this so that we can have some peace of mind in our community and not be fearful of what's taking place with the students. Thank you. Thank 
you. Linda Paul, and then on deck we have Jamie Kenstra. Correct me if I said that wrong. My name is my name is Lydia Pa, and I'm a current sophomore at Germantown High School. I'm here today to offer a first-hand student perspective on some very concerning issues occurring in Germantown schools. I have personally witnessed prejudice and harmful behavior towards my friends and towards my fellow students for expressing their identity or for simply existing. My focus today is to raise awareness specifically about the increasing and alarming rate of anti-Semitism in our schools. Here are some examples examples of anti-Semitic actions and words I have experienced and I have witnessed. Swastikas drawn on surfaces in school. Students given Nazi salutes while saying derogatory comments about Jewish people and the use of anti-Semitic slurs. This is unacceptable and incredibly harmful to the Jewish students of the school. School is supposed to be a place where everyone can feel safe and included and what I have witnessed is the complete opposite. I'm aware that emails have been sent to parents about some recent incidents, but I'm also aware that no real meaningful action has been taken to address this issue. Given the lack of proactive and swift response from the school, these incidents are continuing and increasing on a daily basis. I'm here today to ask you to do something. Doing nothing means you are complicit in these act actions. You are allowing anti-Semitism in the school and this cannot be another issue that gets swept under the rug. Ignoring it is simply not working. I'm asking you to please take action before the end of the school year to address this openly. This is an opportunity for you to educate students in a meaningful ways that aren't performative. Don't just send an email or make an announcement. Do something. We are counting on your leadership and we are counting on you to do the right thing. Thank you. Jamie is up next, and then Mallory Garvis. Hi, uh, Jamie Canestra, GAA representative. Um, I'm just, we're coming here, I should thank you guys for letting us address you guys every time you have a committee meeting. Um, it's really welcome. Um, just a few things to say um, concerning the personnel committee meeting today. We've had many meetings with Chris, and he always talks about problem solving and using data to help solve these problems, identify these problems. When we come to them, that's kind of a big thing. What's the data? So I guess for me, it's like, what's the data that led to changing of our work hours? That's the kind of thing I want to know. To me, it comes off as we didn't do enough this year. Teachers did not work enough this year. Teachers did not do enough. When you're going to add to our hours, that's what you're saying to me. That somehow you guys took data from our principals and our principals said, we, the teachers, did not do enough. So to solve the problem, we need to keep them here more because they didn't work. So I think that's, if that's not the data, then what's the problem if we're going to focus on data-based solutions, data-based problem solving. That's how we are interpreting that. It's like, what didn't we do that we have to change our hours? Was it data-based or is it something that you felt you wanted to do? Is it a problem or something you want? So I guess that's the way we feel about it. Um, I know that's about the, uh, the personnel committee. Thank you. Thank you. Mallory Garvey's and then Melissa Garvey's. Hi, my name is Mallory Garvis. I'm in sixth grade at Kennedy Middle School. I'm here today because there have been many drawings of swastikas around our school. It first started when there was one on my friend's desk. Now, they've gotten worse and nothing except a minor punishment has happened. I saw the first one when it was on the gym floor. 
I was astonished that someone would do something like that. The swastika means universal hate, and the sign, it is the sign of the Nazis. When people write things that are bad, they usually don't know the full meaning of this, or don't think that it is bad. This also causes others to follow their footsteps and write another one for attention. I want this to stop. I think that it would be beneficial for someone to have, for someone to come and teach us about this, so that these drawings will stop. If someone knows about how bad it is, they will stop. I also hope that you will put this plan into action, and these will stop. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Melissa Garvey's and then Brad Shire. Good evening. My name is Melissa Garvis, and I am the parent of two KMS students. I'm here tonight, like the speakers before me, to raise the alarm about the acts of anti-Semitism in our community, especially by students of our school district in the month of May alone. There have been swastikas drawn on the gym floor, as Mallory shared with you, on the boys' bathroom stall at KMS, on the back of a KMS choir door at Altbauer Park, which you heard Sandy tell you about. And there was a metal swastika found by a GHS shop class in the trash bin. Throughout the school year, we have also had swastikas drawn on desks, lockers, school textbooks. But most alarming is the use of white supremacist websites with vile content openly and on school property by Germantown High School students. All of these incidents have multiple witnesses, so whether they happened cannot be denied. The lack of adequate response by district leadership is deeply concerning, and I'm not referring in any way to whatever disciplinary actions may have been taken. The only thing happened in terms of education was an email to KMS families asking parents to talk with their students and that there is an anti-harassment and bullying policy in place. That same email was simply read word for word to students in the following days. No explanation about why swastikas in particular are such a hateful symbol. No focus on using education to address the ignorance that exists, which is supposed to be the purpose of a school. It is time for every person in this room to take a hard look in the mirror and reflect on how our words, our actions, or our silence have contributed to fostering an environment where students feel emboldened to vandalize our community with swastikas. To make our transgender students feel so unsafe they are not comfortable eating in the JHS cafeteria. Where they are assaulted in our restrooms. Where our black students do not feel safe in our schools and hear the N-word regularly. Where all of these students know that the administration is aware of these problems and choose to let it continue because they have made it clear they agree with the aggressors through their words, their actions, or their silence. It is time to begin repairing the damage that has been done to our district. We must stand united against all forms of hate in our community. We must work together to eradicate the hate, especially through education. Every parent of every student in our community should be made aware of what is happening. I am asking that you communicate district-wide with a message that makes it clear hate will not be tolerated in our district any longer and that students will receive education regarding the swastika and its history before school is out for the summer with additional education around diversity and inclusion to follow in the fall when school resumes. Thank you. Brad is up next and then Michael Pickett. Good evening, uh, Brad Sherrick. I'm a parent of one student at KMS. Um, I'm here primarily to support those who are speaking uh, who might have been more directly impacted by the hateful graffiti uh, in the schools, but I did want to um, use the opportunity to share my thoughts as well. Um, and I, I, these are pretty much what I put in the email to you, but I want to speak publicly. While I'm certain it was not intended to come across this way, uh, the intervention, as, as Mel alluded to, that uh, amounted to 
uh, an email going home and then being read word for word to the students. Uh, I think that says that the school district doesn't really care about this problem and has no intention of doing anything about it. I, I, as I said, I'm certain that wasn't the intention. That is the message that came across. Some might disagree, um, but I firmly believe that our schools should be a place where our kids learn about compassion and tolerance. This, this is an opportunity to try to correct things that are clearly happening in their homes where they're learning the opposite. We have to do better. So I'm just here to plead on behalf of those you've heard from and will hear from to do something yet this school year, do something meaningful. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Pickett and then Michael Price. Good evening. I just kind of want to reiterate everything that you've heard tonight about the culture of hate that we have in our schools, unfortunately. Uh, you know, we have incidents of the N-word being written on stalls in the bathroom at the PAC. Two weeks in a row this past fall, we've got swastikas drawn on lockers, doors, windows, floors, just recently at the KMS gym floor. And again, you've heard about the metal swastika made in a shop class in on district property. I mean, it's, it's, it's so unbelievable that we have such a culture of hatred happening in our schools right now. And with recent board policy change, where we can't teach uh, a curriculum about some inclusivity, about tolerance, uh, just, just sending home an email isn't going to make a change. It's just not. You actually need to educate these children on what that symbol means. It is a universal symbol of hatred. I would hope every, all seven of you would agree with that, that it is in a disgusting display of hate. And, and for us to, to turn a blind eye or to not want to address it, it is shameful. I have two children in this district, and I don't ever want them to ever be exposed to such hate and intolerance. But they do. They hear it. The, the things that are said in these hallways, the things, the stories that are shared with, with me from kids, it, it's, it's disgusting. And it, 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 it hurts my heart to feel that children learn this. Where are they learning it? Is it coming from home? Is it, is, does it start with the parent? Is it something that they're learning at school? And if it is, if the excuse is going to be it's learned at school, that just smacks in the face that we have to teach DEI or SEL or some type of curriculum that teaches children that this is unacceptable, that we should be tolerant of everybody's difference. Whether you agree with it or not, children need to be taught this. And I would hope that some action before the end of the school year comes from the, the seven of you. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Price. Yep. Hey, good evening, uh, school board. Thanks for uh, Michael Price. I'm from 590 Stonegate Pass in Colgate, Wisconsin. Uh, I'm here to speak about American Legion Baseball to each of you. Honestly, after uh, that, I'm going to withhold until next month. I think that's way more important than my topic, to be honest. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all. I didn't miss anybody on the list. Okay. Thank you all. Item 5, consent agenda. Item A, approval of the April 24th, 2023 meeting minutes. Approval of teacher resignations and approval of donations. Motion approved consent agenda items A through C. Second. Can second? Okay. Any discussion? I'd like to thank our donors um, this evening that are outlined in the report. We have donations from an anonymous donor to the GHS Choir, the Grant, Grant Foundation, MacArthur PTA generously for field trips and smart TVs, Cabela's um, for our GHS Environmental Club, Ridge, Rivers Edge Nature Center, and Milwaukee Tool. Um, we had a donation from Milwaukee Tool that Mr. Smith, our high school associate um, principal, was able to align we had 10 pallets worth of tools, um, totaling over $134,000 that our technical education um, department will be able to utilize for years to come. Thank you. Mr. Yeah, Paul. I'd also like to take a minute to uh, thank Ashley Holt, oh boy, Holt, 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 <laughs> Emily Jess Goliak, 
to Mary and Melissa Curran for their, so, their service to their students, families, in the Germantown School District. Thank you. Anything further? Okay, hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That passes. Moving on to item six, finance committee. Mr. Lowen. Yes, the finance committee met two weeks ago on Monday, May 8th. The uh, video is up on our website for the full meeting. So what you get here is the uh, Cliff's Notes version. Uh, first thing we did was we approved the uh, April consent of vouchers. Second item is what I refer to as Brittany's variance report. And I'd say the, uh, I don't want to go through all the numbers, but the big numbers are we spent $410,000 approximately less this year than last year at this time, but our revenues were also $406,000 less this year than last year at this time. Next item is our full board item, 6B, and this is the uh, five-year capital improvement plan for 2023 through 2028. And just uh, briefly, the five-year capital improvement plan, CIP, has been created in order to identify, plan, implement, and complete all necessary projects and or updates to the district's facilities and grounds. So uh, we bring a motion to move forward with a positive recommendation to the full board to approve the 2023 five-year capital improvement plan. Okay, that comes with a positive recommendation. Does not require a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That passes. Okay, the next item is uh, full board item 6C and that is a GHS uh, roof replacement. It's listed here as section EE, which is the science wing. It was last replaced 25 years ago, uh, so 1998. And we bring a motion to move forward with a positive recommendation to the full board to approve the replacement GHS roof section EE using FJA Christensen in the amount of, in the amount not to exceed $207,221 funded out of the capital improvements budget. That comes with a positive recommendation. Does not require a second. Any further discussion, questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And that, that was. Passes. That was it for uh, finance. Okay, thank you, Mr. Lowe. You're welcome. Item seven, Teaching and Learning Committee. Mr. Ewert. Um, the Teaching and Learning Committee met on May 15th. We were provided with a proposal for a fall reading pilot program to include the following uh, curriculum resources, Super Kids for grades K through two, HMH's Into Reading, grades K through five, McGraw Hill's Wonders in grades K through five, Pilots consisted, and the pilot program consisted of several levels of data collection, along, data point collection along the way to use for analysis and decision making um, towards the end of that process, as well as provided a timeline for the um, pilot programs. Um, the committee was provided access to each provider's content. Some concerns were noted by the committee due to the content and context from the provider falling short of our communal values. The community the committee motioned to table this decision, citing need for more information as well as alternative providers be explored. Um, and we would look for that to come back in a further committee meeting. I would recommend that if you'd like to see the discussion surrounding the entirety of that to review the um, posted committee meeting. Uh, that's it for item A. Item B, our committee met April 10th um, and received uh, mm -hmm. information and a, um, to move forward with um, the curriculum implementation surrounding open up resources, sixth through eighth grade math, uh, 
at that time, the motion was made as a positive recommendation motion to move forward with a positive recommendation for the full board to approve illustrative math as our sixth through eighth curriculum resource. Uh, we are gonna hear from Jake here in a minute. I find that that current positive recommendation would be an inaccurate um, motion or recommendation given the sources he will be discussing here in a minute uh, regarding open up resources. For that, I would make a motion to um, deny this as written. Okay. Uh, Jake, do you want to clarify? Tell us uh, what came out of committee? <clears throat> yeah, there was a discussion around open up resources, um, and there were some further questions that were asked about that resource versus uh, the difference between illustrative math and open up. Uh, illustrative math, um, if you look at the FAQ on their website, they said that they do not have a partnership with open up resources, so we are recommending that the recommendation to the full board be to approve the open up resources that I'll tell you more about in just a little bit. Okay. If there are further questions, I'd be happy to answer those right now. Um, well, given where that motion is, do we have to vote on that first prior to fielding the rest of the information? Well, you didn't bring it with a positive recommendation. You're saying that wasn't the case. I guess let me clarify, the committee did recommend as a positive recommendation. Okay, then we need to I, vote on that motion. I, and my, my motion was to deny that positive recommendation based off the wording and to have further discussion. So you'd like Second. to withdraw the motion? Withdraw the positive recommendation. So that recommendation. we can see Mr. Mizek's presentation to determine a new yes. motion for approval. Yes. Okay, we'll table that motion. Thank you. All right, so open up resources. The first thing that I'd like to do is I'd like to thank the teachers at KMS who are a part of the math committee um, that um, reviewed the open up resources and um, worked to get us to the point where we were able to recommend a resource to the full board uh, for our 6-8 math curriculum or math resource. Um, so I'd like to thank Jessica Schultz, Amy Willard, Ann Thomas, Tracy Rohde, Marilyn Serwinski, Lauren Usher, Lauren Restivo, Heather Yankee, Brenda Ripplinger, Jody Carroll, and Amanda Flood for their work this year to get us to this position. Um, very early on in the year, we had talked um, about what our priorities would be for the math curriculum, and you can see them up on the screen. Uh, one of the biggest things that they were looking for in a math curriculum was a curriculum or a resource that would get students excited about math. Um, so that was a, a key priority that we were looking for in the resource. One of the things that they noted, um, increased student engagement with math was problems that require inquiry and work to develop deep conceptual understanding. So what they were looking for are, are rich problems, interesting problems that allow kids to explore math. Another thing that we know about middle school kids is middle school kids love to collaborate with one another, so they were looking for a math resource where they could work together in small groups um, to explore problems and come to different solutions and different pathways to solve problems. And the last thing that we were looking for was an alignment to the Wisconsin math standards and the math practices. So the resource that the team would like to recommend to the full board is open up 6-8 math resources. Um, this is a unique resource in that it's a publicly available math curriculum open, uh, available through OpenUp. So OpenUp is, an, uh, is a provider that allows access to their math resource. One of the unique things about them is they've also been independently evaluated by Ed Reports and they receive the highest evaluation uh, possible by Ed Reports in that it meets expectations in terms of its alignment to standards and as well as its usability for teachers. Uh, a high degree of usability is important because that would lead to consistency of the implementation in classrooms. A little bit more on what in an open educational resource is, which OpenUp is, it's an OER. So an OER refers to a teaching and learning resource that's accessible um, to the public without any cost to us. It's released in the public domain. Um, 
under an intellectual property license. These resources can be freely used and repurposed by anyone. We can distribute, tweak, edit, and build upon the materials that carry this license. Um, this provides us a high degree of local control in terms of our content and the ability to uh, edit the content if necessary. Um, as an OER, there's also substantial parent access to this curriculum, which provides a high degree of transparency. Every single student problem is available to the public. So the public can access every single problem that's within this resource. Um, the other thing is it's, it does offer a cost savings to the district. Um, curriculums, I, I don't have a, a specific curriculum that I'm gonna point out now, but <clears throat> they kind of range. Most middle school curriculums also have a, yeah, a book that comes with them on a yearly basis. Um, they average in price somewhere in the neighborhood of $21 to $34 a student. So annually, we could be looking at a cost savings of about $19,000 to $30,000 a year. Another element of being an OAR, um, and in this case, uh, it offers wonderful family resources. So the family resources that are provided by Open Up provide clear explanations about the concepts that are being taught in the classrooms. Um, this provides parents with some idea of the, the concepts that are being worked on as well as some information on how to help them. So when kids come home and they're struggling with their math problems, the family resources offer them some idea about not only the learning outcome that the students are working towards, but it also provides them some examples and some illustrations about um, how they can work with their student to help them solve the problems. Dr. Reuter tweaked my presentation. I promise you that all of those words were once in black. <laughs> <coughs> and very readable. I just wanted the slides to match for the viewers at home. So. Huh. I'm also colorblind, so he helped me out with the color scheme. <laughs> um, I think you skipped a little bit of my information, so if it was back in the timeline. Uh, a lot of this information on the timeline was provided to the Teaching and Learning Committee. So early in July and August, um, the curriculum uh, team met to review what the priorities were and we established the priorities that I explained to you earlier. The other thing that we did was we engaged in a discussion around Five Levers. Five Levers is a book that um, kind of illustrates to teachers the um, degree of change that they're looking for within um, the, the scope of their program. So our teachers, some of the higher levers that we focused on was standards so that there's consistency in educational outcomes. Um, the strategies that are being used within the classroom, so Open Up has several routines that the students engage in on a regular basis that foster uh, collaboration and discussion, which are uh, teaching strategies that lead to greater gains in student outcomes. And finally, uh, instilling in students a belief in themselves that they are capable of handling any math problem that they see, that they can all see themselves as math students. Um, there are some times that we hear students say, well, I'm not a math student, or a parent say, well, I was never good at math, and that's exactly not the attitude that we want our students to come away from our math program with. We want all of our students to become flexible problem solvers that are able to, to tackle or be willing to tackle tough problems that they see. Um, in early September, we identified the priorities of our new curriculum as well as we looked at the best practices in mathematics and we determined professional development needs that the teachers would need to effectively pilot open up resources. One of the things that our teachers um, suggested very early on was that when they initially started using the, the resources in 2021, um, they weren't necessarily sure as to how to implement those resources. So we partnered with CESA 6 and the math center at CESA 6 uh, to provide some professional development around open up resources so that teachers um, could feel successful when they piloted the materials and tried them in the classroom. And then in November and December, they piloted open up resources in all 6A classrooms, which led to at least one unit being used at the 6th and 7th grade level. They've been using open up resources all year long. Uh, you can go back. In, no. <laughs> in January, um, that's when we evaluated the resources. So we met as a team. 
uh, and we evaluated the resources, and again, this was information that I provided to the Teaching and Learning Committee. Uh, the team evaluated the resources based on rigor and balance, focus and coherence, and usability, and at that point, we determined that we would make a positive recommendation to the Teaching and Learning Committee. Uh, in February, teachers further prioritized standards, so they looked at what the key elements of each piece of the curriculum or the resource were and how that aligned to our educational goals. And then in March, we further provided additional professional development to our teachers associated with open up resources so that they could continue to use those um, successfully. The professional development that was provided to the teachers in March actually wasn't just aligned to open up resources, but it was aligned to high yield strategies that work in mathematics, so it would uh, work with any math resource that we selected, irregardless of our move to open up. So what they were looking at were different structures and strategies that we could use in the classroom so that students could become collaborative and work through problems together. So what open up resources is, is it's a problem-based um, resource in mathematics, and the goal is to provide students an opportunity to um, have exposure to a problem and then work through those problems. Teachers often give them students a start, they frame the problem, and then they release students to work through those problems um, and then prompt them as they work on the problems. The goal is for students in math classes to spend the majority of math time working on math problems. So the value of this approach is students spend more of their time working on the math practices, which you're going to see on the next slide. The math practices are kind of the transfer goals that we have for students in math, and they are what we want students to have once they leave um, the Germantown School District. We want students to be able to uh, make sense of problems. We want them to try different approaches once they hit barriers. We want them to be able to evaluate the reasonableness of their answers and make sure that um, once they arrive at a solution that they're able to evaluate that solution and decide whether or not that solution makes sense. And one of the things that our teachers said from very early on was that they wanted to make sure that whatever resource that um, we selected, that there was a high degree of focus on the Wisconsin State Mathematics practice standards. And those practice standards are what I just described to you in terms of the, the, the different uh, skills that we hope students to develop while they're working in a problem-based scenario. So a typical lesson in open up resources, um, this could look like a typical math class. In the very beginning, there's a warm-up, and that warm-up sort of gears kids up for the day. That warm-up can be used for a variety of reasons, so it could be used to review content, or it could be used to prime students to get ready for the problem that they're going to engage with. After that, they're going to engage in one or more instructional activities. Those instructional activities have several purposes um, that I outlined on the next slide, which include providing students with a math problem that they can see in context. Um, they help students develop a deep conceptual understanding of a math um, problem. They introduce a new representation of a problem so they can induce a little bit of cognitive dissonance or make students feel a little confused at first to see how this new representation fits in how they previously thought math worked. Um, it can be a little bit more traditional and help students formalize a definition around a math concept and it helps students work towards mastery of a concept or a procedure. Once you move towards the end of an open up lesson, that's the point at which typically um, we see this in a, in a traditional classroom where a concept is taught. So in a typical classroom, sometimes that concept is taught at the beginning where a teacher gives students enough information to complete a lot of problems. In, um, this kind of flipped scenario at the end of the lesson, that's where the teachers start pulling it together. So they look at the variety of different paths that students have taken. They talk to students about how they arrived at their solution. They allow students to argue and discuss uh, the procedures that they took to arrive at a particular answer. And then the teacher works to create the conceptual understanding of the math concept that they were looking for or the goal that they had for that day. And at the very end, what I did for you is I included just a couple of the examples, but again, I would encourage you to take a look um, on their website because every single problem in Open Up is something that uh, we have access to. Uh, 
OpenUp has a couple of nice features in it. They have some simulations that students are able to play with to develop conceptual understanding. So the first problem that I have here, it's not an interactive on the slide, but it is an interactive in the resource where students can manipulate the amount of colors that are in um, these graduated cylinders. And as they do that, they start to develop an understanding of ratios and proportions. And then on the next slide, you can see a more traditional type problem that you'd see in OpenUp. But again, I wanted to give you a feel for what a problem-based problem would look like in that students are given a couple of representations of different problems, and they're asked to use both the table and the graph to start making some predictions about um, a baseball player's performance. And at this point, um, I would uh, ask for any questions that you might have regarding open up resources, or I would like to propose um, that we adopt the 6-8 open up resources as our primary middle school math resource. Okay. <clears throat> Mr. Paul. So the original positive recommendation from and let me get my notes here from the teaching and learning committee held on April 10th was a motion to move forward with a positive recommendation for the full board to approve illustrative math as our sixth through eighth curricular resource. Um, so procedurally, you're trying to clear up. Yeah, we're right. So what I would do is withdraw my motion. Um, no. My motion to disregard that as inaccurate, which was on the table. I will withdraw that. So now we have to deal with the positive recommendation of illustrative math from the committee. So for the community's understanding, this happened on the 10th, and our last meeting it was on the agenda to discuss this. However, with the new appointments to the committee and the board, we wanted to make sure everyone had time to vet the curriculum prior to making this motion at a meeting. Um, we thought that was uh, towards the beginning of that meeting. I believe we removed it from the agenda. I made the motion to remove it from the agenda for that reason. Uh, since then, members have had a chance, to, new members have had a chance to take a look at it as long as existing members take a chance to, to look, relook at some of the issues or information provided. Um, however, the positive recommendations still stands so the board as a whole has to make a decision on that. Is that sound right? Okay, just for clarity, um, we're talking about illustrative math and we're talking about open math. Are these one and the same? Are these something different? Yep, so <clears throat> originally illustrative math authored the open up resources. Once it was released to open up as an OER, um, illustrative math said they are not in partnership with Open Up, so for increased clarity, it would make sense to adopt Open Up resources as our 6-8 curriculum and not illustrative math. Okay, so the, the motion was for open or? Was the positive recommendation was for illustrative math, but. I'm just confused as far as what's on the table. Out. You had mentioned that you would make a motion, but okay, bring the bring the yeah. positive recommendation forward again, and then we'll so, vote on that. Yep, and I withdrew my initial. So, the motion to move forward with a positive recommendation to the full board to approve illustrative math as our sixth through eighth curriculum resource presented by the committee. Okay, that comes with a positive recommendation. Does not require a second discussion. Let, let me throw another wrench into the mix. We don't have that specific action item on our agenda. We don't have illustrative math action on illustrative math so, on our agenda. And what Tom's pointing out is currently the agenda states tonight's recommendation is for open up. Motion to approve open up resources 6 or 8th math as our 6 or 8th resource. So Okay, that makes sense. is we don't need to take action on Correct. The, the positive recommendation from the committee. I don't, at some point we, we may can. have to take action on it, but we can't tonight Correct. because it's not on our agenda. Correct. 
but we do have the open up resources available for a motion. Correct. Which would require a second. So, so the board right. could approve open up resource this evening as an action item. Correct. And table the positive recommendation for We've illustrative. And in the June meeting, technically we can't withdraw. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So it's tabled. So I guess I do have a question on the um, open up resources and regarding ed reports. So my understanding is that Germantown has said that we want to move away and stay away from Common Core. Um, according to um, ed reports, um, they do not, unless a curriculum has Common Core, they don't evaluate it. It's automatically kicked out, which means that open up resources is involved common core. So <clears throat> the Wisconsin state standards have a degree of similarity to the common core standards. So when we look at the Wisconsin state standards, those are the same standards that our students are evaluated on on the forward exam as well as our state report card is based on. So when we looked at the open up resources, what we did was we looked at it through the lens of the Wisconsin state standards and the standards that we prioritized. So what we were looking for was, does the open up resources, or do the open up resources um, meet what we're looking for in terms of the Wisconsin state standards, and they do. So um, what we're looking for in a <coughs> curriculum resource is a resource that provides students access to the content and skills that they're going to need to do well on the forward exam, as well as standards that we've prioritized that said, these are things that students need to be successful in math and progress through our math curriculums. So when we look at the curriculum for bridges that goes from K through five, um, do you think that, because um, it's, it sounds like it's a different type of um, curriculum where you go from maybe more problem-based solving to now these, you know, the traditional, I guess, what I would consider traditional to a different style of curriculum. Yeah, so bridges that we use um, at the K-5 level and then open up, which we um, could use at the 6-8 level, both of them have more of this conceptual understanding slash problem-based approach. Um, so they actually fit pretty well together. Uh, in addition, some of the routines, although they go, go by a different name in Bridges, are very similar to the same routines that they would see in Open Up. So some of the um, activities that students are familiar with in Bridges that they've experienced in their K-5 um, classrooms would be similar to the structures that they would see in Open Up. I have a question. Um, for clarity purposes, um, you said that Open Up is not in partnership with Illustrative Math. Yeah, on Illustrative Math, their website has an FAQ, and on that FAQ, um, Illustrative Math uh, lets you know the partners that they have. So there are several curricula, um, some curriculum companies that have actually purchased um, that curriculum because it's in OER, uh, they can do that, and then they've packaged it, and now they're selling that same curriculum. Um, so you can buy versions of illustrative math, but every time that that company, um, you know, they purchase it, they work with illustrative in terms of the changes that they can and right. can make as they publish them. Um, that's not the relationship that they have with Open Up. So Open Up. Um, and, the, and the FAQ states that Illustrative is not in partnership with. They're not in partnership with, but Open Up is offering the Illustrative Math curriculum as developed by Bill McCallum. Um, the curriculum was originally authored by Illustrative Math and then Open Up. Uh, it was offered to them as an OAR as well. So then as Open Up has it, it's now their resource. It's a resource, but the base curriculum is illustrative math. Correct. As developed by Bill McCallum. Correct. Who developed Common Core. So they're just repackaging illustrative math. There are, if you were to look at each one of the 
certified partners of illustrative math, there are differences that exist between open up and the certified partners. Look, I, I'm sure there's differences, but the core curriculum is illustrative math. It was originally authored by illustrative math, correct. Okay, so Bill McCallum developed it. They've now, for lack of better sayings, licensed it out to various selling groups. Right. Okay. Just for a little bit of history, I think we need to go back to the beginning of when we rejected Common Core. The problem at the time that we noticed with Common Core is it was a very politicized curriculum. And that was the issue that we had with it. It would look more like indoctrination rather than education. This to me does not seem to have that issue when we look at the open up resource. I looked through the problems, I didn't see, you know, a politicization of the curriculum in this. And I think the fact that it's transparent is exactly what we want. I do worry about, I mean, I do like the fact that it's free, but I always worry that you get what you pay for and that there are things that can happen down the road that could make this very difficult for us to accept. But with the transparent part of it, I do appreciate, as far as the curriculum goes, I think that's what this community wants. We want to be able to see what our kids are being taught in school. And this seems to be a robust math program from what I can tell as well. So from my perspective, this part of it I like. Um, where it came from and who's all involved in it, as long as we can monitor it and see it. Um, have we gotten any feedback from parents or students on this at all? Have we sought that out? There has not been any um, concerns that have been raised by parents in terms of the problems, uh, in terms of feedback that um, we've received from um, our students. Our, you know, that was anecdotally collected from our teachers and our teachers who um, use the curriculum or the resources in both the pilot and then our six, seven teachers. Um, once they started using it with their students, they saw an increase in engagement, which is one of the reasons why they wanted to continue to use it with their students. So this is a kind of a unique resource. Um, teachers started using it in 21, in the 22 school year, and our sixth and seventh grade teachers used it for different durations, but a good chunk of 21, 22, and then we restarted the pilot in 22, or 23, 20, 22, 23, this school year. Um, and we did that so that we could make sure that teachers had effective training along with it so that we could evaluate it as well as implement rubrics to monitor it. So as they did that, um, they felt a little better equipped to use open up resources and with feeling a little bit better equipped to use it, they also saw increased results with their students. Um, so that they understood how it worked a little better. Um, at the end of the day, our teachers, like I said, the, the full team of 6-8, which is another unique um, piece of this curriculum review team that all of our 6, 7, and 8th grade teachers use this uh, math resource. At one point during the school year, um, they came to the consensus that this would be the, the resource that they wanted to recommend. Um, to your um, point earlier about it being freely available, um, all of the, you can download the entire version of, you know, it's in its second iteration. Um, it will go into a third iteration, but we could take the entire second iteration and download it at this point, and then we would have access to it. Um, so that's one of the, the pieces of being an OAR. So we would have access to it for as long as that we would need to. Yeah, and I did appreciate that because before the last meeting, I was able to go on their website and, and look at the problems and go through lessons for each grade and be able to see exactly what they were doing. Um, I think that's what we need and want. Mr. Barney. Yeah, we've kind of talked about what I'm going to ask, but I'm just going to ask it a different way. What's the difference between what you piloted <coughs> illustrative math and what you're recommending tonight? It's exactly the same resource. It was kind of, um, so it was making a distinction between, um, so uh, the original motion, we were trying to be clear in that, that it was open up resources, but it was authored by illustrative math. We're just changing it for terms of clarity that this is the open up resource to make sure that there isn't any confusion that it's illustrative math because that, again, is offered by several different um, companies, and we want to be clear about what resource we're actually recommending to adopt. 
And I, I'd remind the board that you adopted standards in July, the Wisconsin State standards that Mr. Miziak is speaking of that are the benchmarks of our state assessments that then correlate to our state report card to show us as a district how we perform, which is front facing to our community and um, perspective new people to our community. Um, and additionally, we, we've used the term resource in the last year because this is truly a resource. We can download the entire thing and pick and choose out what problems, what we want to use because you have local control of the standards and through previous teaching and learning committees, Mr. Miziak has shown the work that our teachers are doing on, through understanding by design where we prioritize set standards and build a so, scope and sequence that has not existed in this district. That's curriculum. This is the resource that would support it. So it doesn't mean we're lockstep with every problem, but we need something as a model so we're not making it up as we go along. So I do like the fact that we are, have access and we can change things, but I just want to read you as far as your comment about politicizing education, right? This is a um, quote from the CEO of Open Up. Um, we have work to do internally and connected to our curricula, which has the power to positively catalyze change in our country through liberating educational experiences. Now, that is an extremely political comment. So I guess in, in understanding that we can change things, right, but how um, extensive, labor extensive is that going to be to keep monitoring, you know, every year and the changes in the curriculum? <clears throat> As was stated earlier, I think, one, we've had access to these problems um, for the last two years, and as teachers have worked through them, um, they haven't found problems that they've um, felt that way about. Um, I think the two examples, I didn't, um, I, I literally could click into any of them and show you those problems. So the, the ones that I selected were to both highlight some of the um, representation pieces that are there, plus a little bit of the, give you a feel for the problem-based piece of it. Sometimes when we say those things in education, the, the terms are um, uh, misconstrued. So I wanted to make clear what we were working on. I don't believe this is gonna be a labor-intensive process for our teachers. Um, there, there was not a high degree of change that our teachers felt that they needed to make within the problems, nor were there any problems that they stumbled upon that um, they didn't think worked towards the educational goals that we have. But again, we can download it as um, a particular version. So we've got version two, which, um, and you have access to all of those through that OAR. So version two is completely accessible to everybody. Um, as a board member, you have a school district email so you can get into the educational side of things. Um, parents don't have the same access as educators for some obvious reasons. The, the number one being that they don't have access to like answer keys and things like that for all the problems because our students could get into that and then their homework would be, be very easy at that point in time. Um, so that's one of the, the, the differences or distinctions between the educator access and the and um, the parent access, but in terms of the parent access, they have access to all of the problems that exist within it. It's just the, um, the teacher side offers that. Okay, anything so, for Mr. Prowler? Uh, One is you mentioned, change of pace here, you mentioned book saving. Yep. Um, what's available to them, to the students, for paper? Because I know a lot of times having that pencil, putting it on paper. So the cost savings, yes, book versus no book, I totally get. But what does that do? How are we going to manage that aspect of it with regards to, I understand some things are online and interactive yep. is good because you, know, you get to yep. see those changes real time, but how do we also work around it? Uh, so there's a couple things. So like an increase in paper cost, we essentially have been using it, and that's sixth and seventh grade, and then eighth grade has um, printed much of their own materials as they've you know, pulled things to try and meet standards or that were similar to the materials that they had been using previously. So our paper consumption year to year, I don't think is going to see like a significant increase to next year. However, like the ability to, to have problems sent home, um, teachers, given that it's um, an OAR, they can download the problem sets, 
um, they can select within them. So uh, often what middle school curriculums will do or resources will do is they'll provide you know, 12 example problems and then it's the teacher who's deciding which of the 12 problems that they think their students might need some additional practice in. So um, the, one of the big differences between purchasing you know, a bound set of problems versus having problems that they can kind of select from is there is a paper savings on that. Uh, coming from a district that purchased volumes on a year-to-year -year basis, uh, my teachers, again, would look through them and say, well, these, my students have already mastered these problems. I don't want them to do them, so we're going to skip them. So then you're essentially wasting some of the paper at that point in time. Um, the other thing that, um, if you visit some of our middle school classrooms, one of the things that they're doing to encourage collaboration uh, is there's a lot of vertical surfaces and whiteboards, and then there's also white or tables that they're using um, to allow students to work on problems together. So um, they can give students access to the problems on their Chromebook, they can look at it, but then they're working together collaboratively either on the vertical space, the, the whiteboard, or on the, the tables. Um, I've seen it in several of the classrooms. They're not even whiteboard tables, they're just your standard tables and the, the kids will draw on those as well. Apparently they wipe off just as clean as the whiteboards, but that's, um, it gives teachers a flexibility in, in terms of how they would like to utilize the problems. For a problem like the one that you're looking at, obviously this one's a little bit more complex where it's, they might want students to have access to a, a piece of paper. Uh, we can download the entire resource <laughs> and have that saved. I can put it in the teaching and learning drive that I own, which would then give all of our teachers access to version two, um, and then we can evaluate version three as it comes forward. Um, they have draft teacher materials, um, and they don't look significantly different than version two. I think they've made a couple of um, enhancements in their opinions in terms of some of the problems. So uh, they receive feedback from teachers that, you know, there's a particular problem that students struggled with because there's, um, you know, a lack of clarity that's within the problem that there was some misunderstanding. So sometimes as you increase the, or they go from version one to version two, um, a lot of that's just rewording of certain problems to make them more clear to students as to what students are expected to do. But we'd be able to download the entire version two so that teachers have access to that from here on out. Mr. Regler. I was going to go off course from what we were talking about, but if you were on course with it. What's it? If you're on course with what he's discussing right now, I'm going to take the conversation in another direction. I, I was going to take it in a little different direction also, so go ahead. Okay. Um, so I am and Open Up Resources are both offered free, right? And in my research, looking at it, they're both 501Cs, so they're receiving funding for that somehow. It's not from us as a district. Uh, looking at their donor list, it seems to be an identical list. Um, to me, that is signaling a partnership there as, or I would look at it as I am is the curriculum or the resource. and open up resources as the gateway to it in partnership. And I know you've said a couple of times now that it's not, but I've read articles specifically from IM stating they are. So we're having confliction there, right? An issue there as far as information accuracy. Um, when I discussed the reading curriculum update or pilot program that you brought forward, there were several data point collections built into that process. I think those are driven from conversations around not having data to help make this decision other than, well, somebody says this is working. So we don't have a data point to show, have our students shown improvement based off our utilization of this program. Do we have data now 
since we've last had that conversation, or are we still lacking that data? There's been an inconsistency in terms of MAP administration at the middle school level for the last couple of years, so there's often not a spring data point for us to compare to. So there isn't a standard data set that I can take to take a look at how students have performed using this resource as compared to a different resource. Um, one of the unique challenges of this, and this is one of the big differences between um, the, the reading pilot and uh, this, this resource was already in the hands of teachers and had already been in the hands of teachers for an extended period of time by the time that we looked at utilizing the resource. So they had access to it all of last school year and were using it all of last school year. So the discussion for it was to evaluate this one particular resource in alignment with our goals. So in, that, that in structure, that's one of the biggest differences where we're going to collect more data points within the reading pilot because we're collecting it on uh, potentially three different resources at this point in time. And that, that kind of leads into the next question I had is um, the original pilot predates you for this curriculum. It, it didn't work the first time around? Uh, our sixth and seventh grade teachers continued to use that resource. So part of it was for us to evaluate the resource more critically. So this year we spent time looking at both the standards, um, the uh, strategies that are used to teach math, and then look at that through the lens of open up resources. So again, it, it's not that um, it failed the first time through, it just didn't have any structure teachers um, were given the materials last fall and then asked to use them, but there wasn't necessarily any kind of information that was being collected or asked of the teachers as they were using those materials in the classroom. So this time through, what we did was we started to look at it um, and then I provided some of the information that we evaluated it through and then had discussions on. Okay. Nor so was there training or professional development. They were given the resource and off you go. Got so it. And then there, there's very little measurement or right. follow along the way, so this year we spent doing that. So you then come into the role and you're handed this curriculum, we'll say. Um, it's not like you personally reviewed it. You kind of said, this is where we're going with it. We need to now the second year measure it and get a better idea of how it did. So that was one of the decisions that we first talked about back in August was whether to continue using the resource. And at that point in time, teachers had um, experienced the resource long enough that they wanted to continue to use it. Okay. Uh, so a lot of it was based on our teachers' experience with the resource in their classroom with students from the previous school year and them making the call that they would like to continue to take a look at that resource and evaluate it to make sure that it met our educational goals. Okay, so you continued it. It's not like you took a look at any other resources at, point, at that point. Correct. Okay. Have you since then take a look, taken a look at other re math curriculum that is not based on illustrative math? We have not. Um, one of the challenges was the degree of utilization that had already existed with our teaching staff. So given that they were um, provided with the resource at the beginning of last school year and had already used it for an entire school year, um, the undoing and taking out uh, would have uh, created some inconsistencies for our students that we weren't looking for. Okay, we're not trying to put a square peg in a round hole and just for inconvenience. Um, I would say that part of the reason why they were able to continue with it is some of the features that I put forward. So it met where this resource checked a lot of the boxes that we were looking for in terms of a resource, um, that it was a high quality resource, that it was uh, aligned with the math practices that it offered our students rich problems. So given the quality of the resource, I think that's why our teachers wanted to continue to use it. Okay, so you're, can you you believe that this is the resource that will make up the lost learning problem we have in math? 
I think a resource only goes as far as the teaching strategies that we have with our teachers. So I think there's there's a a lot of factors that go into um, making sure that our students continue to make educational gains in mathematics. I think a lot of that comes through what I proposed to the Teaching and Learning Committee, uh, committee around the loss of learning plan, where there's professional development that we provide to our teachers um, in terms of the teaching strategies that go along with growing our math students. Um, it's, you can't just take a resource, give it to our teachers, and then expect that that one particular resource is going to be the thing that's going to move all of our kids forward. It's the, it's the way that our teachers use it with our students, it's the strategies that they use, and then it's that belief that they're able to instill in their students that they're able to attack math problems. So the resource in and of itself is, is not the, the magic ingredient. I think it's the teachers that we have and the strategies that they use. And if the teachers are provided with high quality problems to start with as the basis of um, the curriculum, that this can form the foundation for what we're looking for. Okay. So uh, along that line, Zen, um, is there any data that suggests or shows that you've said a couple times getting the students engaged doing group type projects. As we've seen a decline in math scores across the United States over the last few years, and this type of curriculum has been out there, is there data that suggests that group math, kids getting together in small groups, is beneficial? Uh, collaborative work as well as discussion in math um, are high yield strategies that have been studied by numerous uh, researchers. There's meta-analysis that's provided by John Hattie that outlines several key strategies. The strategies that we would promote our teachers use in the classroom are also strategies that yield high growth in students. Are we talking SEL or raw data that says the students see an uptick in math scores through working with groups? Um, can you repeat the question? I'll shorten it up. Um, are we seeing, is there hard data out there? You said, you know, they've, they've researched it, they've taken a look at it, and I, I get all that, but the end result is, are kids achieving better math scores using this type of approach? The strategies that have been evaluated show higher growth in students. And I, I'm, so talking, specifically, I'm talking specifically the, the groups, kids breaking up in small groups, working through problems in a group of three or four, then I guess the teacher would come over and, and monitor at that point. Because you keep saying the, the, the kids like the engagement factor. I mean, we gotta get kids engaged, and, and I get that. If the kid's not engaged, if the teacher's not engaged, nobody's learning. But at some point, we have so many minutes a day in the classroom, we have to be teaching these kids. We have fallen behind in math. Do kids like it because they get to hang out with three other people or you shook your head no, so is there data that shows that? So putting students into groups, so that collaboration piece has multiple factors that go into it. So uh, when you put students into groups so that they can work on math problems, you increase the amount of time on task that students have. So working on the actual problems, that strategy alone increases educational gains. In addition to that, that fosters the opportunity for students to discuss and debate. That strategy increases students' gains in math. So yes, the, the sit and get, so if I'm you know, going back to a, math, a traditional math classroom where teachers in front of the classroom, they teach a concept and then they allow students um, to work independently for a long duration of time or they speak at students for a long duration of time and then um, ask them to do a few number of problems at the end, those um, educational structures would not have the same educational gains as the methods that I've described. If you have, I mean, obviously kids learn differently. So if you do have a student that learns through traditional learning, through repetition, because there is value to repetition, and we all know that in our daily lives. So is there a balance between just doing repetitive problems versus working maybe on two or three problems in a you know, 45, 50 minute class. 
um, there is some value to developing fluency with um, problems that require a high degree of um, procedure, so you know, same steps, um, but that doesn't necessarily create deep conceptual understanding of math that's durable, that lasts, that then um, students can carry forward. So yes, there is a benefit to doing, um, you know, multiple problems, um, and there are strategies to do that effectively. Most of the time, um, some of the strategies that there's been research shown that these are strategies that positively impact learning would be things like mixing up those problems. So unlike what we've seen um, more in a traditional classroom where you'd have 20 problems of exactly the same, they call that block practice mixed practice where students have multiple types of different problems to deal with that yields higher learning gains than block practice. So the more traditional approach of I'm going to teach you a lesson, you're going to do 20 problems or just the odds, um, that approach does not necessarily yield as high a result as students learning how to attack a problem in this method and then maybe later on getting three or four problems from different units. So that's kind of a shift from the traditional math classroom. Okay, just to move things along a little bit, we'll keep the discussion going, but I want to have a motion on the table if we're going to have a motion and we can keep the discussion going. So I'll entertain a motion at this point if we want to talk about open up resource. Second, and I think your mic's not on. Okay, Mr. Pollock with a motion. Mr. Barney with a second. Any further discussion? Yes. Mr. Barney. Go ahead, Russ. Um, in reviewing some of the resource information provided, specifically on open up resources, um, I'm trying to figure out where in their literature I'm sorry, in the resource itself, reflecting from their literature that they're tackling dismantling systemic racism in K through 12 education in the United States. Do we see that come through in the resource itself? Uh, I don't believe so. Um, when you. So, and, and I ask that for the simple fact that their chief academics, equity, and social justice officer, quote, states, Dr. Childs brings a vast uh, experience through K through 16 as an educator, speaker, author, and thought leader for open up, to open up resource senior leadership team, parent, uh, partnering in develop, to develop and drive forward key strategic initiatives to the organization in service of dismantling systemic racism in K through 12 education in the United States. So is this company doing that, or are they not doing that? And would this be a disingenuous statement from them? I don't want to evaluate their mission. When we evaluated the resources, there wasn't um, anything that I saw within those resources that um, I think I could um, justify that statement. So I, I, would not, I would not take a position one way or another on, on that. I find the inconsistency there. Um, to me, that means they're doing it. I'm just wondering how they're doing it. When we evaluated the resource, that was not one of the lenses that we were looking for. Again, um, as I provided through the Teaching and Learning Committee, the, the way that we evaluated the resource and the priorities that we had, those were the things that we were looking for within the resource. Mr. Barney? Can you re recap again how many classes have piloted this over the last couple of years? Um, so in the six, seven, um, Classrooms, they average four or five teachers. So all of six, all of seven piloted it in the 21-22 school year. All of our classrooms piloted it in the 22-23 school year. Our sixth and seventh grade classrooms have used it for nearly the entire year. 
And I say nearly because they've supplemented in certain places where they thought students needed some additional practice problems and things like that. Eighth grade, or eighth grade piloted for a select unit, so they did it specifically for a unit. Got it. So is it safe to say if we do nothing, they'll probably continue to use it next year? Um, I would say if the board is not recommending to use it that um, I think our teachers would be in a position where they'd want, I mean, if it's not something that they would, if the board doesn't recommend to continue to use it, I don't know that our teachers would want to continue to use it. But if they like the curriculum, even if we you know, don't approve it, then they would have a choice obviously to go back to what they were using or this. Correct. So and I if think they, they see the value in it. They would continue to use this versus doing well, absolutely. And I think that's what happened. I think if we wouldn't allow it, they wouldn't have the option to use it. And right. I, I would think that a teacher would be think that prior. if a board did not approve said curriculum, that that would mean that it's not something that should be utilized in Germantown, which puts our middle school teachers in a predicament, especially at sixth and seventh grade, to go back to what they were doing two years ago during the learning loss period of time and inventing it as they go along. And to Mrs. Higginbotham's point, uh, they did have that choice. So I think what happened was they had the opportunity to go back to using the other resource and they wanted to continue to use this. So they chose to use it during the 23, 24 school year. Uh, once they transit, like once they were offered the opportunity to use it in last school year, um, the sixth and seventh grade team liked the, the resource and continued to use it with their students as opposed to reverting back to using um, the old resource, which was the Connected Math Project. So moving forward, if, I mean, if this was the curriculum that they used, do we are putting in place better um, ways of uh, seeing if it is a successful curriculum versus you know, just saying it's so then you move into um, the later phases of a curriculum review. So there are, are additional things that we would do in years three, four, and five of the curriculum review. Um, we would continue to look at the priority standards, how they are um, represented within the resource. We would start looking at common assessments that are aligned to the, the standards so that we could take a look at how the resource is performing within classrooms. We could look at variances that may exist between classrooms based on those common assessments. So in years three, four, and five, we would refine the curriculum or the resource. Anything further? Mike? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, some students really won't learn, I think. Maybe I was one of them unless they work the problems themselves. So you, you've got this um, collaboration in the classroom. Is there enough homework assigned that students do work problems on their own also? Our, our teachers still do assign homework problems to students when they feel like they need additional practice on any skill. Um, one of the things that comes of resource reviews, and this happened in my previous district, when they look at math problems, um, there are, are sometimes math teachers that don't, they, they love assigning math problems. So that's one of the things where um, if there was one of the, the minor criticisms of it was just the number or possible options of math problems that they could assign to students for homework, um, given that it's an OER, we are able to, to add to it fairly easily and add problems if teachers thought that there were some additional problems that students needed for, for practice purposes. Okay. Mr. Ebert. I was just going to say to follow up on Mike's point there, is there, an option, is there an option or can we have as an option in class groups and those that want to work individually? Um, I think as a former middle school teacher, that's one of the things that you always kind of have at your discretion. So it, it sort of depends on the educational goal. Uh, I would have a, a hard time believing that our, edu our, our teachers in that instance, when they have a student who came to them and said, I would really like to work through this problem on my own, that they would say no, unless they had a, a solid reason to do that. Um, 
And then again, as a former middle school teacher and a middle school principal, um, I would say more often than not, our students want to work in that collaborative environment. But there obviously are times where students can work independently. Um, I have been in classrooms this year. Uh, when you look at that structure of the, the classroom during that warm-up period, sometimes teachers ask students to work independently during that time, work through the problem on your own, see what you come to, and then compare your strategy or your result with you know, the students that you're working with. Um, another strategy could be for students to independently tackle one of the problems that they eventually release them to collaborate on. So work through a piece of it independently, and then they send them out into their groups to work. So there, there are multiple structures that teachers could use so that students have the opportunity to work independently. Um, I will also reassure you that our teachers use um, you know, tests and quizzes and all those other opportunities. You'll see that there's a cool down phase to um, the normal structure of um, the open up routines. The cool down is typically something that students complete on their own um, and can be used as an assessment so teachers can understand how well did the student you know, um, conceptualize or understand the material that was being worked on? They apply it on their own during the cool down phase of the lesson so that the teacher can collect some data on, on how well um, the student learned that day. I, do, I just want to make sure that while they're in the classroom, every student has the opportunity to do as much work as <coughs> they can and be accountable for it. Instead of sitting in a group and having the smart kid always do the work and go, oh, looks good. Ultimately, students would be accountable for their learning on the assessments that we provide to students. Ultimately, and I don't want that to be a D or something on a test. And I, I would argue that our teachers don't want that either. So oh, those are those instances where they want to make sure that they're maximizing opportunities for students to learn. And again, I would say, um, as a middle school teacher, if a student came to me and said, hey, I'd like to work on this by myself for a while, I wouldn't let them do that. Mr. Ebert? That, that seems to keep being a one-off. You keep kind of addressing that as if that would rarely happen, that's maybe a one-off, as opposed to just saying, it's time to, time to do what we learned, and let's see what you learned. Break into groups, or those of you that want to you know, struggle on this independently, have at it. I, and that's purely from my own experience. I, and again, I would not argue that all learners are the same in any way. So right, I, but aren't, aren't we then aren't we kind of forcing them, saying whether you like to be in a group environment or not, you're, you're going to be in a group environment? No, because I think students, again, in instances where they'd like to, they would often ask to work independently. And within the structures, there are opportunities for students to work independently. Um, often to start the lesson or to end the lesson, there's chances for them to do it. Or in the other structures that I explained earlier, where you might use that to allow students to kind of grapple with the problem first before you release them to work collaboratively. Our final tests, are those done independently so that all of a sudden you don't have it, you know, like you said, a student sitting back and all of a sudden you, know, you get to the end of the year and they have not picked up the concepts because they've sat back? All along the way there are formative checks and tests that come at the end of the unit that students are doing independently. Mr. Ebert? Um, kind of to, to Eric's point, while well, I'm listening to you explain this process, if we have three students working together and two are strong and one is significantly showing issues, I shouldn't say significantly showing issues, have struggling with the problem, how does the teacher identify that student and ensure they get the assistance they need versus the group did well uh, in that masking the student's poor performance and by poor performance I'm struggling due to they don't have the skill sets uh, to meet the so, so how does the teacher identify that there's a student within the group yeah, that's prior, struggling? Prior to the testing process. Yep. So the time we hit the testing yeah. process, at the so there multiple yeah. times, right? So uh, you could see it one a common practice of our teachers. So there's assigned work as students are engaging in that warm up. 
they're walking around the room to check the independent work students did at night. Another way to check it would be as students are working in the beginning phase of the lesson, the warm-up piece, they're walking around, they're taking a look at students' progress. At the end of the lesson, you can see it when you have that cool down. Another opportunity, as students are working in those groups, teachers are walking around and they're talking to their students while they're engaged in it and they're asking them questions about the process that's being used. So you could imagine that if you've got a group of three and there's a student who's writing on the board, what the teacher might do is walk over and ask one of the students in the group, hey, can you explain what he or she is doing at this point in time? And then that student would be you know, explaining the work that's happening on the board. Those are all ways that teachers can gauge along the way how well a student is progressing with a concept. So there's multiple times that students or teachers could check in with students to see how they're progressing. Can I ask that because I want to make sure we're not letting anyone slip through the cracks uh, due to some of this group work that we're engaging in. I'd hate to see a student fall behind because we missed the chance to identify the issue in the system at the time they needed it. Well, it's, a, it's a valid point on an ongoing basis, but sometimes those peers on that one-off can actually do a better job of benefiting teachers, but they can actually do a better job of explaining it to one of their peers. So this is what this is what you're struggling. So on a one-off, a group environment can actually help that struggling student. But ultimately, on an ongoing basis, through quizzes, through ongoing work, through interaction throughout the day, I think I, I have confidence that, that teachers will pick up on it. Yeah, our so teachers are going to recognize yeah, I, I mean, if there's, there's an issue. There's a couple of things out there, but, but uh, in my experience, sometimes it's better for my high schooler to talk to my middle schooler about an issue and not even involve me. And let them figure it out. Very good. Um, as far as the math curriculum, I support this for the reasons I stated earlier. I think we've heard a couple of red flags that were mentioned here that could be a potential future problem down the road. But from what I've analyzed and what I've seen, I don't see those popping up in the actual curriculum itself. And I think the fact that our teachers are seeing this as rigorous, that they're, it's open and transparent, that we can review this, that we can actually see it, um, I would support this moving forward. Mr. Barney. Yeah, um, first, Jake, <laughs> you're doing great sitting in front of this firing squad tonight, so <laughs> thank you. Um, I, I think at this point, we're gonna cause a disruption if we don't move forward with it because we're two years removed from the curriculum they used before it. Given that there was learning loss during COVID, I'm not interested in causing further learning loss. Um, it was recommended by the staff. It has the transparency we're looking for as a district. And because of that transparency, if there's any political activism in it, we'll find it and we'll see it because everything's public. So I'm in favor of moving forward with it. Two quick points. A, uh, what? Can I not make two points? Go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> I was, I, I was going to echo the same thing. Jake, thank you for sitting there and taking fire from the board. Math and literacy are the foundations of education. If we get this wrong, one, one more lost year is gonna look like a walk in the park. We, we shouldn't have done it. So thank you for sitting there and we gotta fully vet this thing. Um, the other thing is to, to kind of circle back, we keep saying, well, you know, we'll find it, we'll find it, we'll find it. In the investment world, and we're hearing it across everybody's 401ks and 403bs, is ESG investing, environmental social, social governance, where it's not the investment itself, but we as investment managers are looking at the company and saying, are you a good student, stu steward of conservation? Are you championing the right causes? And if you do go to these websites and look at these companies, you will find it. So it may not be in the equations, but the company itself, just like the, the big rage out there now is ESG investing and taking a look at a company and seeing what their values are. So I, I suggest if you go to these companies' websites, it's, it's right there. I, I would reiterate this is a stagnant curriculum. This is version two we're looking at that we could, if you approve tonight, Jake can hit download and it's stagnant it's not evolving with an update every week or every day so we will have that captured we can look at it and use it as a resource towards the standards that have been prioritized and adopted by the board so again it's stagnant it's not growing or changing every day that we have to be watching or the concern of the board or community members what is in front of us is what's in front of us today and over the next couple of years as we utilize this curriculum to its potential. <coughs> Thank you. I, I, I agree, and I don't think that was a concern that there's 
sneaking equations in. It was just from a company standpoint. A lot of these questions are coming up that doing the due diligence, we went out and looked at these companies and went, well, why are they going down this path? So I, I don't think Jake, you've done a good job saying, you know, it's not here. It's not in the, the equations in anything. So I, I just wanted to point out that a lot of the questions that you hear coming at you are from the side of the education world. They, they, to your credit, you're not looking at it. You're focusing strictly on the curriculum. So I, I would echo what most of the people said up here tonight, that we appreciate your due diligence and your willingness to sit there and uh, facilitate this open discussion on all these issues. Uh, you and I have had private conversations in regards to um, approaches when looking at curriculum. And I've always challenged you kind of with, I think, two things. One being, A, the best curriculum for our students possible, and, and B, clean curriculum, non-agendized curriculum. But I, I've always added a notation to that. If the cleanest curriculum we could possibly find is bad curriculum, that's equally, if not worse, than uh, editable curriculum. Uh, as frustrating as that is for me to sit here and see the world not open itself up to <coughs> mathematics and, and its need to insert a political agenda into them, and our due diligence then requires us to refute some of that while taking the good resource and curriculum from it. Uh, that could be frustrating, but we've challenged you with uh, really challenging us with that question. Can we do it? Do we trust you guys as the district and our teaching staff to do that? Um, those are the real key issues I weigh in this. I understand the teachers bought into this program probably due to its piloting process, which I think we've also discussed and said was a uh, initially a failed process due to the person that was implementing it and how she implemented it. And, and you kind of brought it back around as a, a true implementation of a pilot with giving those teachers those resources. Because they weren't overly in favor of this. My understanding is the first time around due to some of those, uh, those uh, support pillars not being there. Once we gave them that, it seems like they bought in and under, they, they believe this is the way to go. Okay, anything further? All right, we have a motion on the table by Mr. Pollock to approve the open up resources six through eight math with a second by Barney. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That passes. Anything else from teaching and learning? I think he's good for the night. <laughs> <laughs> I still have one more thing coming, so. Thank you, Jake. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you much. Moving on to personnel committee, Mr. Ebert, back to you. Oh, I had a whole other subject tonight. Oh, ah, that's my. This should be a shorter discussion, although it shouldn't. It's not unimportant. Um, let me get to where we were at. So we met this evening. Um, I believe the entire board was there for the discussion and participated in it. Uh, we heard from Mike. <laughs> regarding um, OPEB, which is our retirement compensation, as well as full compensation study. Um, I believe the board was pretty well in support of conducting a full study uh, to see where we, we fall as far as uh, overall compensation as well as retirement <coughs> compensation. Those would be two independent studies given their nature, uh, probably being done parallel to each other so we should see in probably along the lines of next month uh, some recommendations and a full plan for implementation to conduct those studies. Um, we also heard discussion brought forward from the district office regarding certified staff start and end times um, and their desire to have some of that more formally set. Uh, and with that, I, we, the committee would bring forward a motion to move forward with a positive recommendation to the full board to approve the proposed modifications to teacher start and end times to be noted to in the teacher section of the employee handbook for the beginning of the 23-24 school year. Okay, that comes with a positive recommendation. Does not require a second. Any discussion? I will just say, um, Jamie, thanks for coming tonight. 
Um, I hope you didn't hear anything from us that we don't appreciate our teachers as professionals. Um, I think I would like us to go to that point where our teacher hours are just professional hours, just like some other school districts do. I think that is a direction we're heading, we're going. Um, I think the eight hours gives us that flexibility to be able to have those meetings and communications with our teachers when we need it. Um, I don't think we're locking anybody into an eight hour schedule and trying to cut your pay or doing anything like that. We totally respect our teachers and appreciate all that you do. So just from the board perspective, I hope you don't feel that from us. So thank you. Well, I think what was pointed out though during the meeting was I'll use an elementary school example. If all of the teachers know that they need to be, we'll use Amy Bell, they need to be at Amy Bell from 8 till 4, and, and their current start time is 8.30, that the expectation from their peers is that if we need to meet at 8 o'clock outside of school hours, they can, because that's the expectation. We all know that teachers in general grade their quizzes, grade their tests, do all of their prep work, all of this other stuff within the confines of the normal <coughs> proposed or normal start and end days. But they also do that in the evenings, early in the morning, on the weekends occasionally, because they have to. Because right now, you're expected to be in seven, you know, seven hours, 15 minutes, seven and a half hours, whatever the case is. The start and end times don't define how much work you do because we know that you do it outside of those times as well. Okay, any further discussion? <clears throat> Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That passes. Moving on to item nine, new business. Discussion and action to approve WIAA Boys and Girls Lacrosse Co-op. Dr. Royer. Thank you, I have a report in the packet from Missy Nerdle, our athletic director, to share with you regarding um, WIA uh, Board of Controls approved this last year and sanctioned um, lacrosse as a WIA sport for both boys and girls. Um, Ms. Unerdo provided an interest survey to all of our <coughs> GHS students to see what their interest would be for the 23-24 um, school year startup season. And based on that interest, um, we did not have enough to field our own team in both boys and girls. And similarly, in the Hamilton School District and Menominee Falls School District, um, they had minimal numbers as well, but together as a co-op, like we do in other sports in our district, um, we can provide access for both boys and girls. Hamilton would host um, those are, as the, would be the host school, and their athletic director would run um, the operations of the program. We would pay a fee per student participation as outlined here, um, and you can see the interest that we, we do have for next school year. Um, ranging from grades 9 to 12. Hamilton has a club that they've had established as a, um, like a co-curricular co club for lacrosse that other school districts in the area have had um, to participate. So we would just be joining that club, but now is it fully functioning WIA varsity sport. So we're looking for approval this evening to join the co-op as outlined um, for the 23-24 school year. Thank you. I'll entertain a motion. Motion to approve the WIAA Boys and Girls Lacrosse Co-op, as presented. Second. Mr. Brownie with the motion, Mr. Ewer with the second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That passes. Moving on to item B, discussion and action to approve board meeting schedule, Dr. Ryder. Yes, outlined here is the proposed board schedule for the um, current 23-24 uh, school year starting in July. Just looking to see if any, there are any feedback or comments from the board. We, um, with approval tonight, we'll publish that on our district website. Mr. Ewart. Mr. Ewart. Um, the decision for the board to move to a singular meeting a month was made before I was on it, and I forget the rationale behind it. Other, I believe it was something along the lines to provide the board <coughs> a chance to um, review, digest the material presented at committee meetings and give us a couple weeks to vet some of that information prior to making a board decision. Um, I think we see like what happened here this evening with the personnel committee that doesn't always come through. And I think sometimes we also see, and I've seen several times, uh, board actions that need to be taken that are taken late mm -hmm. 
due to having one meeting a month. Um, is there a way we can mitigate those issues and keep this current setup, or is it simply easier to go back to two meetings a month uh, and whatever curricular curric uh, committee meetings that occur on that same date would have to be reserved for action the following meeting? Um, I guess I'll address it a little bit since I am the one that kind of came up with this format when I became the board president last year. Um, what we were finding was having the two board meetings work well for timing issues, like you said, and we want to keep that flexibility. We have the two dates set up so that we can run the committee meetings, and again, gives you that time to digest and review, and, and before you make the decision at the board level, <coughs> we can have um, more time to review material, which makes perfect sense. Um, having the meeting and then immediately having to make the decision at the board doesn't give you the background to be able to go search and that we've tabled items because of that. Um, and I've said since I've been on the board that we want time to be able to make decisions. We don't want to have something presented at the board meeting, have to make a decision that night without being able to do any homework, any research <coughs> at all. So we've kind of gotten away with that. Um, by keeping those two dates with the committee meetings, it gives us a lot of time to delve into the topic at the committee level and then bring it to the board. Um, as far as your timing issues with some things being late, if we have to, we have that option to throw another board meeting in there for the committee meeting. So I, I like the idea of the flexibility. And generally, if you look past the last several months, our board meetings haven't gotten much longer but it actually shortens it because all of the action happens in the committees. Mm -hmm. So I think there's an advantage to doing it this way um, and keeping it with the flexibility that we can always have a meeting. And we've had to do that on several occasions. I think where some of the things with the timing that have come up have been travel issues when all of a sudden a team is eligible for a state tournament or a, um, like tonight we have some of our co-curricular clubs and they are leaving they in four quick. days from when the eligibility came up. I'm, so in those instances, we can either call a special meeting to approve that or we can have a discussion, further discussion about how we want to handle those. But we've, we've been working, Melissa, my assistant, I've been working when it comes to donation approvals and any of the um, overnight field trips to be very cognizant with our advisors, with our co-curricular department of being proactive with that versus it's being turned in at the last second. But those instances have come up in the past year where the team has already left and mm -hmm. you're approving their travel. Yeah, and I think there's been some contractual issues too that have come up um, as far as uh, hires go. Mm -hmm. I think we've seen that. Uh, ultimately, if we're flexible in having that to meet those needs and, and we're not slowing down board business and <coughs> actually being taken in a diligent manner, because that's a balance. Yep. Uh, I don't see a problem with it. I just wanted to have the discussion to make sure we're not stunting district actions um, due to the scheduling. Yeah, I didn't look through every single date to check my calendar, but for the most part, this looks familiar as to what our board has done in the past, and the dates look good. Um, so I'm okay with it. And Ms. Altendorf gave her input for the annual meeting so that that's aligned for budgetary reasons as well. Perfect. Yes, sir, Lord. I prefer the old way better, two meetings a month. It gives the uh, citizens uh, two chances to speak to the board rather than one. And, it, it, you know, back as a newbie board member, that's a long time ago now, it was difficult to do a finance committee meeting and then deliver to the full board right after. That, that, that was a tough job. Uh, but after so many years now, it, it's actually tougher to have a finance committee meeting two weeks ago and now deliver it to the board because now I have to remember for two weeks or have notes on you know what we talked about so I'd rather actually you know do it the same night it'd be easier on me at this point but I, I, I admit that you know in 2012 it was different chairman of the finance committee is having it on the second meeting before the board meeting. I think that would help Brittany get all the materials she needs put together anyway. Again, we committee talk, meetings, we've we can designated talk. a time on the schedule for committee meetings, but those can be held exactly. just like board meetings at any time. And I mean, case in point, we've had committee meetings this past month not on the scheduled night because of the need to have the, the discussion. Right, and we've had chairs that held the meeting on a Wednesday because that was a day that worked for them. 
I mean, or the work for the committee. So there is flexibility there. And we record all of our committee meetings, so there's that access too then for community and other board members. I'd say it seems we're unique in that matter too, as far as the transparency provided to the work being done in the committees uh, to some of our surrounding districts who do not record them. Correct. Exactly. Uh, and hold them during the day instead of evenings where parents and community members could come in. I think that's a huge distinction I've seen uh, from our district to some of the surrounding districts. Yeah, and I would also add that as committee chairs of your committees, you have the opportunity to bring in public comment. If you choose at your committee meeting to allow the public to discuss topics that you're presented with that evening, by all means, bring them on. So that is also a possibility. Anybody else? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That passes. Moving on to item C, discussion and action to approve 2023 summer school contracts. Mr. Masai. In April, I brought to you the summer school schedule and the classes that we were hold, offering. Hold, hold, hold on. I'm not sure we had a motion and a second on that, Brian. Oh, okay. So I'll make a motion. We had a good discussion. You're right, I didn't write that down. <laughs> I'll okay. make a motion to approve the 23-24 board meeting schedule as presented. Second. Okay. Mr. Barney with the motion, Mr. Pollock with the second. We'll try this again. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That still passes. <laughs> All right, now we'll go down to C. Thank you, Jack. So in April, I brought forth the summer school classes that we were offering um, this summer, and tonight I'm bringing forward the contracts for the teachers who will be um, teaching those classes. So what I would like to recommend, I don't have to read all these names, correct? <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Um, um, what I would like to do is recommend to approve the contracts as presented um, with one note that there's one position that uh, we had previously filled but is now open that the, the teacher was unable to fulfill um, or wasn't able to um, take that contract. So we removed that one. It's not in here, but there's one more position that I need to fill as well as um, there's some minor uh, aids that we might need to do for students who might have some needs during the summer. So there are a limited number of contracts that we still need to, to fill. Okay, I'll, I'll entertain the motion. I recommend to approve the contracts as presented. Second. Mrs. Hagenbotham with the motion, and Mr. Pollock with the second. Any discussion? Mr. Ewart. Just wanted to ensure we'll get those prior to them actually working their contracted hours. <laughs> uh, I would hope so. I'm, <laughs> We're working to fill that position. Sure. Mr. Barney? I covered it. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That passes. Moving on, item D, discussion and action to approve extended school year contract. Mr. Lamb. Yes, each year we have a few students who are in a unique uh, place with progress towards their IEP goals and their IEP teams determine that um, a break in service would result in significant regression that would um, take too long during the fall to recoup. So um, those students have extended school year services incorporated into their IEPs to um, control for that possible regression over the summer. And so we ask that you approve the staff that are indicated in the background uh, to provide the extended school year services this summer. Okay, thank you. I'll entertain a motion. Motion to approve the extended school year contracts as presented. Second. Mr. Barney with the motion. Mrs. Higginbotham with the second. Any discussion? Um, will we see, I know last year we saw two rounds in regards to IP evaluations. That's different than what we're looking at now, correct? Correct. Want, in my head, I want to make sure. Correct. Yeah, this is different. Okay. <coughs> Anything further? See none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That passes. Moving on to item D, discussion and action to approve FBLA overnight field trip request. Mr. Ryder, Dr. Thank Ryder. you. Future Business Leaders of America, or FBLA, um, are heading to the National Leadership Conference from June 21st through July 1st in Georgia. Um, we're looking for a motion to approve tonight overnight travel request for 10 students and two advisors for that trip to Georgia. Um, and I believe all expenses are paid out of their fundraising account. Excellent. I'll entertain a motion. Motion to approve the overnight travel request for 
10 students and two advisors to travel to Atlanta, Georgia from July 21st to July, June 21st to July 21st, June 21st to July 1st, 2023 to attend the FBLA National Leadership Conference 2023. Second. All right, Mr. Ewart with the motion. Ms. Hagenbotham with the second. Any further discussion? I'd like to congratulate them and wish them good luck. All Safe of the travels. Groups. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That passes. Moving on to item F, discussion and action to approve Skills USA overnight field trip request. Dr. Ryder. Yes, we have two <coughs> students heading to Atlanta, Georgia. It must be the destination of choice for these national competitions. And one advisor um, at a conference at this conference to compete against students from across the nation in the Skills USA 2023 National Conference. Um, so we're looking for a motion this evening to approve the overnight travel for two students and one advisor, and all expenses are covered by the students through fundraising. Thank you. I'll entertain a motion. I'd mm -hmm. like to make a motion to approve the overnight travel request for <clears throat> two students and one advisor to travel to Atlanta, Georgia from June 19th through the 23rd, 2023, to attend the 2023 Skills USA National Conference. I'll second. Okay. Mr. Loth with the motion, Mr. Brown with the second. Any further discussion? I would like to wish uh, Mr. Stahoyak and his students the best of luck. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That passes. Moving on to item G, discussion and action to approve HASA overnight field request, field trip request. Dr. Ryder. Yep, the Health and Occupational Students of America, HOSA, um, would like to attend the International Leadership Conference in Dallas, Texas, and there is an error in the recommendation. It says Atlanta, Georgia, so just as note, they're not all three going to Atlanta, Georgia. Um, from June 21st to the 25th, it would be five students and one advisor, and all expenses are paid by this, covered by the student through fundraising. All right, I'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to approve the overnight travel request for two students and one advisor to travel to Texas, Dallas, Texas, from June 21st to June 25th, 2023, to attend the HOSA International Leadership Conference. Second. Okay, Mr. Brown with the motion, Mr. Pollock with the second. Any further discussion? <coughs> Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That passes. All right, I'll entertain a motion to enter into closed session pursuant to Wisconsin State Statute 19.851E to deliberate and negotiate the purchase of public properties, the investment of district funds, or to conduct or the conduct of other board business wherever competitive and bargaining reasons require a closed session. Wisconsin State Statute 19.851D to consider strategies for crime detection and prevention and also Wisconsin State Statute 19.851C for considering employment, promotion, compensation, or performance evaluation data of any public employee over which the governmental body has jurisdiction or exercises responsibility. So moved. Second. second. Okay, Mr. Pollock, Mr. Barney with the second. Roll call. Medvin. Yes. Ewart. Yes. Myself, yes. Loth. Yes. Pollock. Yes. Higginbotham. Here. Yes. Brown. Yes. All right, we are in closed session at 912. We are not coming out? Nope. Okay, we will not be coming out of closed session. Thank you all for coming. Please drive home safely. <coughs>